Thanks, Jeff, and um, thanks for calling me an expert. It's <laughs> from you, that's kind of pleasing. Anyway, um, I'll be briefly talking here about Europe's Lost Frontiers um, from the remote sensing side of things, um, looking at 3D seismic and also um, 2D. Um, apologies, this will be a whistle stop tour due to the time constraints, but hopefully, this will give you an understanding of what we've done and some of the processes we've done to achieve this. First thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> It's going. <laughs> first thing is that obviously we have a series of targets we have to meet. And um, the first, this is obviously to use the legacy 2D and 3D reflection data um, to achieve a high degree of coverage um, to not obviously achieve the best possible mapping we can. We can't obviously cover everything, but we try to cover as much as we can with the data that is publicly available to us. Um, we also want to provide an interpretation from the regional down to the human scale. And this is quite important. And this will be part of the topic of this talk is stepping down in scales from the big to the small. We also need to provide material that will be used that will allow our co other colleagues to extract, um, for example, DNA or archaeo-environmental uh, material from the sediments, and we need to locate those sediments. And the other thing, obviously, the, the main um, goal of this is to provide data on the landscape that can be ploughed back into simulation. You can see one of Phil's little simulations in the bottom there. So the background, obviously, very briefly, um, as archaeologists, maps have dominated our thinking of the Paleolithic and Mesolithic in Doggerland. Um, obviously, we need accurate maps to guide us to archaeology. We need to locate where people are living and understand how that um, exists. And that's true for both the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. Um, one of the critical aims, obviously, this part of the project is to improve the maps that we have, expand them, investigate new areas, and to see what extent they might need revision. Now, there have been some geological surveys in this area, for example, um, Britice being a major one, looking at the Glake Glacial um, and the glacial processes that go on. And some of their seismic is, is actually very interesting, but obviously that's targeted for deeper sediments, older sediments, and not really for the Holocene. Obviously, Vince has touched on the Humber REC, um, again, funded by the ALSF, and a very good um, thing which allowed us to look in detail. But again, we have gaps in those lines, so we can't join things up. There have been some very small detailed surveys for Andy Emery and, Prinz and Anderson, excuse my um, pronunciation. Um, but both of those, again, using energy data, have picked up the late, Pali um, late Pleistocene, some of the Holocene. Um, but again, they're little windows into the landscape, and we need a big joined up picture to understand the archaeology and Doggerland as a whole. So obviously, as Vincent just showed you, these are the some of the data sets we've used. And as you can see, there's an awful lot of them. Um, obviously, very, very useful 2D um, data, but obviously has gaps between lines and 3D data, the blue blocks you see there. Obviously, it covers quite a large amount of landscape. And hopefully, as I'll show later, we've covered a lot of this landscape in quite some detail, which will allow us to actually refine our understanding. So the 3D data set, um, my primary one is PGS's um, SNS data set, which is shown here in the red. Um, we have used this in the past, but this new data set we've used is it's been expanded to new areas. There's some additional data sets that have been bolted on, so it's a lot bigger, um, some 10, 15% bigger than the original um, North Sea and um, later the um, American survey that we did. Um, we've also had access as well to the blue outlined area, which is the CNS data, and that is totally new to us in archaeology. Um, that has allowed us to not only explore the um, northeastern side of Doggerland, but also move up, and it, this data set, it doesn't show it here, but goes all the way to the Norwegian Trench. So it allows us to explore the whole of what might have been Dog Doggerland in the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. So we're got a very useful um, set of data that covers this area in 2D. But obviously, there are other areas. And as you can see here, some of the other data sets we've gained from other geological surveys and oil companies that allow us to cover the areas which aren't covered by 3D in some detail and allow us to map features. Obviously, they're profiles, but and that obviously means there's some interpolation between the lines. But it does allow us to gain at least a better understanding of some of the features within that landscape. So. One of the things we obviously want to look at is 3D data. And as you can see, the 3D data produces a wonderful map view of the landscape, both temporally and spatially. As you can see here, for example, the little Pallia channel in blue, this is a very late, place, late Pleistocene, early Holocene channel, as you can see, meandering down from the Dogger Bank, um, probably following the course of an old um, glacial meltwater channel, which has then been reused. But as we go slightly shallower and further up in time, so towards the end end of the Dogger Bank, we can see, for example, the area of inundation, the coastline there, which is drawn in and green. 
and on the this is on the the gray image and you can see a later channel the cross cutting the older channel so the drainage pattern has changed to affect um, to reflect the change in the um, coastline and the inundation so we can actually start seeing the landscape in detail understanding some of the processes some of the things that have gone on spatially um, within that landscape oh, and hopefully yeah so one of the things we can do is obviously map that up as a GIS. And as you can see, this is now the revised GIS. It's covering a lot further in the landscape and showing a lot more interesting things. Um, as you can see, there are some areas we still have where there is no data. Or, for example, there is data, but it is not yet publicly available, so we can't gain access to it. And I've drawn them on there just to show you. Once those become available, it will be very, very useful to be able to join things up. But even with these small holes in the data, and they are relatively small holes, we can actually start joining up features, having very long channel systems, which we can start understanding the nature of the landscape, its connectedness, and the connectedness of the environments within the landscape, which is really important. Now, those simple um, GIS shape files actually hide some complexity beneath them. Uh, when you look at some of these features, and for example, this is one of the big channel features at the bottom of the Dogger Bank, which has previously not been noticed. Um, they, they actually are made up of many different phases, many different times. And obviously, you can't reflect all of that in a GIS shape file. However, how we've actually recorded the GIS shape files does allow us to understand the evolution of the landscape and how everything connects together. And that's really important because obviously, it is a very complex landscape. If you look at the bottom image, just the, the raw output from one of these seismic image um, slot time slices, it is quite a complex picture. Um, and although you can just about, you can obviously make out the big paleo channel, you don't, it's very hard sometimes to understand how all these things connect and how they all relate to each other. And so having GIS interpretation files is really important in allowing us to break that all down and make it understandable. Now, obviously we've looked at a big, regional landscape and we've mapped that all and produced wonderful images and a lot of new areas which have never been mapped before have been mapped um, but we archaeologically we want to drop down um, in the landscape from a, a more regional to a more local scale and therefore obviously as Vince has mentioned in collaboration with Liz um, uh, we have actually gone out and taken a parametric echo sounder and looked at some of these selective features in more detail um, and through looking at these we have a variety of seismic fascias which we've seen come up that allow us to understand the study area a little bit better um, for example, just to let people know, SRF stands for Southern River Fasces, that Southern River being the location where we have basically made a type site of these different types of fasces, which allow us to expand the interpretation out over other areas. Um, most interesting of these are those that relate to the emergence of the landscape, um, and these being, for example, Southern River Valley 3, related to floodplain deposits, Southern River Valley 4, which are the main paleo channel deposits, but also Southern River Valley 5, which is related to sand and gravel deposits at the base of the, some of these channels, and also, more importantly, Southern River Valley 6 type, which are basically fascias which relate to the inundation through and intertidal deposits within some of these channels, which are very, very um, good for preserving certain types of features. So once we've got all these fascias and that data mapped within the landscape, obviously we want to produce surfaces for the archaeological modelers. Um, and so one of the things, one of the problems we have, obviously, as you've seen with many of the 2D areas and things like that, is we have got some gaps between the data. And so the data is therefore combined, as you can see, the, the um, colored image um, which is rather garishly red-green, um, we combine some of the seismic pick data, obviously with bathymetry data, to produce a surface, which is a combined combination of the two, which allows us to at least produce an approximation in most of the landscape of a continuous land surface. Obviously, the bathymetry isn't perfect. In those areas where we don't have full D3D um, seismic data, we have to rely a little bit on that. Um, that has a problem, obviously, that bathymetry is a product of both erosion and deposition, but at least it is a reasonable proxy and allows us to actually um, produce a model for surface for um, modeling. This um, contiguous surface is obviously very, very good for archaeological modeling. And Philip will talk about this slightly later. But obviously, it does make some very good graphics as well. Now, one of the benefits of that unified surface is obviously we can um, actually explore the effects of sea level rise, for example, models taken by Sarah Bradley and Sheffield um, can be applied to this. Um, and so we can actually model the rise of sea level and see the effects on the land surface, on the landscape. And we can actually understand, for example, how inundation breaks up the landscape 
where inundation occurs and how it affects the features in that landscape. So you can see here through these various um, slides going from the late Paleolithic through to the early Mesolithic through to just before Storahiga and into the Neolithic, how the landscape starts breaking up, how it affects the features until eventually in the Neolithic, virtually none of the features are actually available. And there's just a little rump of land sitting off um, East Anglia and off um, the coasts of the Netherlands. Um, so what, so the coastlines are quite important and they allow us to uh, um, understand the correlation between the map features and the coastlines. And they allow us to test the coherency of the picture um, through the Mesolithic through and throughout the Paleolithic um, and see some out where there are errors, mainly because of the bathymetry. Now this has allowed us to gain a lot of new insights. Um, so the north, one of the things we have seen, and because we have the CNS data that goes much further to the north um, and stretches up to the Norwegian Trench, is we can see that the landscape is a lot, extends to the north, a lot smaller um, than it does, than we previously thought. Um, it, that doesn't mean necessarily there aren't, isn't the Lake Paleolithic coastlines to the north in Scotland, they do exist, but more excitingly, they're perhaps close to the coastline and shallower than we previously thought. And um, that's really, really interesting. But it also means, for example, that the landscape um, to the north, uh, the northern coastal dogger land is also very, very stable and very, very important. Um, so we've gained all these new insights and that's really interesting, um, but it does mean we're gonna have to change some of our maps. Um, for example, this is one idea for Splash Cross in 2009, and you can see the change just applying some of these new thoughts of the occupiable land, that's a place where people could have lived, um, in, tw in 2021. And there's quite a big change in that. Now, it's important to think what would happen around the world if we applied that. And I haven't done that yet, but it is something to be done. And I know that um, it's something that will be discussed later in this talk by James um, about the impacts of some of these things. It is when we start applying these potential methodologies, it could have some very big impacts into our understanding of human occupation and movement through the landscape um, worldwide, which is quite interesting. So obviously I've mentioned um, the late Paleolithic and certainly for the Doggerland at least, um, we have some very new insights. Um, one of the big ones being the coastal stability of the northern coastline of Doggerland and the Dogger Bank. Um, certainly from about 21,000 kilo years BP, kilo arms BP, sorry, um, to almost the submergence of Doggerland, that coastline stays relatively stable. Um, also very interestingly, many of the ch paleo channels you see here are reused or modified. Um, and so they exist throughout various periods of um, history and they provide an imprint in the landscape which continues on into the Mesolithic. Um, there are also some more unstable features, for example, the outer silver pit lake and its outflow. Um, and whilst it's a rapidly changing feature, it does have real significance to understanding our landscape. And so there's some real, this provides a real new opportunity to start investigating and doing some really new significant research into the late Paleolithic, which we couldn't do before. Um, previously, we'd kind of guess where the coastlines are. Now we have a fair idea of where we are. We're kind of at the beginning of the North Sea Paleo Landscape project back in 2007, um, thinking of where, where we go with it with Mesolithic. In the Paleolithic, we now have at least some idea of where to start. And so that's really important and offers a new springboard for research there. Obviously, in the Mesolithic, there are some major changes. And again, we can see the importance of the Paleo Channel networks within here, the connectedness of the landscapes and the connectedness between what is currently a modern landscape. Um, we also have very interesting the three axes of flooding. Um, previously, we kind of had a theory, you know, that we, we, the landscape was inundated from the north. Um, now we have three axes with the outer silver pit, the Channel River in the south, and the L, which allow water into this landscape from three main directions. And that's really significant. Um, it allows us to start thinking about the impacts on the Mesolithic occupants in this landscape and how that uh, um, impact differed around the North Sea and Doggerland Basin. Now, the southern embayment is quite interesting. Um, now, work by Michael de Klerk in Belgium um, from some of the cores down from the Belgian continental shelf started showing this. And um, this has been confirmed and supported by its cores in Southern River and um, um, Brown Bank that the inundation in this area has started relatively much earlier than we thought. And that's quite interesting because obviously it provides a whole new environment of resources, of travel and access into the landscape, um, which in the early Mesolithic, we perhaps weren't quite as aware of as we thought we might be. And um, it also has some interesting implications. Obviously, whilst the area that's flooded isn't available for occupation, it perhaps the landscape around it, the edges and the coastlines would have been more attractive and may for occupation and may have actually explained some of the distribution of the finds we find in some of these dredge finds. 
So that's looking very broadly at a regional landscape. We'll drill down now, perhaps into a more local um, look. Now, obviously, one of the things, as Vince has shown, we need to support, obviously, environmental coring. We need to target down and find these caches of material in the landscape. And, you know, we'll take here um, the Southern River as an example, just to show you how that was achieved. Now, the Southern River is a large, the large green river here, as you can see with all the dots in the center, um, just it cuts through several different glacial moraines formed by the last glaciation, pushing basically sediment, dumping sediment as, as it um, expanded and retreated through various stages. There are, it is only one of several other channels in that region, which run down to a coastline, um, shown in black here. Um, they all penetrate the um, glacial moraines and follow, some of them follow the paths of late glacial meltwater channels. Um, other ones are cut later, but by and large, these are fl glacial, sorry, fl fl fluvial glacial channels that have been reused um, in later periods and used into the Holocene as active channels. So we've taken pro active profiles across this. You can see here a seismic line across the data. Um, and as we can see from our the um, models and seismic flashes we built up, we can understand that looking at that um, particular parallel channel, that is rather full of um, SRF6, the um, intertidal deposits. And when we core it, and you can see on the cores up there, you can see lovely laminated sediments all the way through. So that's good because it allows us to validate. Um, so we're predicting what the um, sediment caches are within that a feature we see, we can assess its environmental and archaeological potential. And then when we go and core it, that gives us a better idea of what we're going to get out of it. And that's really important. Um, for example, previous um, survey we've been involved in many years ago, um, when we just used 2D coring um, and sonar, which is mapping the seabed, um, we only got about 48% success rate of getting material we needed archaeologically. Now, when we use the ELF survey, we use 3D, Defined by 2D, so we have a, a picture of a landscape, um, and we know the position of the core in that landscape, and we know how it, where it is in the feature, and we can know what the sediment is, is and we got a much better success rate between eight, 90 and 82 percent, um, and that's really significant. It's a big up thing. It also, of course, means for our pal environmentalists and um, you know other work, DNA where people work, a lot more work. But that's a good thing, and it's a good recovery. And compared to the slide Vince showed earlier, for example, of just taking calls pretty much randomly is a much more significant achievement and given the you know difficulties of taking um survey in this area and recovering material obviously any kind of step forward in that way is a good thing now obviously we're archaeologists and um you know recovering and mapping landscapes recovering sediments and that's it's all very nice and very, very useful. Um, and it allows us to tell us, you know, about the resources in the landscape, the DNA, for example, you know, marine mammals, um, you know, and other critters in the landscape, as well as plants. And of course, the paleontology telling us about plants, the geology can tell us about flint resources and freshwater resources within the landscape. Um, but we want to see the people and like Terry Jones there in Monty Python, how not to be seen, you know, we have people hiding behind bushes and trees, we, we don't see the people from the, the things in the landscape, and we can't really ask them to stand up to know where they are. So we obviously need to start using some of the high resolution stuff and start drilling down. And so obviously, the techniques we have done, um, allow us to start looking into this landscape in more detail. Now, obviously, talking about the find will be covered by, I think, by James and several other people later. Um, but by actually using these techniques of looking at the landscape, and here you can see the 3D surface of the landscape, the paleo channel, the estuary, we can start predicting where people would have lived in that landscape and then targeting high resolution survey over that. And then, obviously, we can then go to recovery. So that's a real benefit in actually allowing us to understand the various different stages of actually working down from the big down to the small and actually starting making recovery. So we're now getting to the stage where instead of guessing and relying on chance finds for locating archaeology, we can actually do specific targeted work, actually know in the landscape where things are, look at the, the environment, look at where the resources are, and then start targeting using our archaeological knowledge where we can actually find things and evidence of people. And that's a really big step forward and where we, we we hope to be in the future and go forward in. And that's going to be a big area of research, certainly in the future. So some some conclusions for you, and then we'll move on to questions. Um, 
really what the work has been has been very successful in providing a much more comprehensive map of the emerging inland holocene landscape than has been pre-achieved in the past. We've looked certainly at the south in great detail. The CNS data has allowed us to look further north and actually confirm what many other people have, have you know, thought about huge great glaciers and that, that actually perhaps they're not good places to live. And so as archaeologists, we now have to start real, really thinking about the late Paleolithic and Mesolithic landscape um, in terms of that coastline, that northern um, Dogger Bank coastline, and obviously thinking as well for places like Scotland, you know, late Paleolithic coastlines being a lot closer to the shoreline, and that's really important and really more, means really exciting in terms of new frontiers of research, allows us to actually start predicting and looking at, for areas where we can actually start um, prospecting for archaeology, which is quite interesting. And obviously on the Mesolithic front, it allows us a whole new understanding of the connectedness of the landscape, the different resources and environments within that landscape, and how they all join together and how Britain and Europe, through its various forms, is connected in many different ways and how that linkage as the sea level rose and the inundation occurred was broken up. Obviously, we have new insights into the multiple regional scales, working up from the large scale down to the small scale. And we can now have a kind of methodology where we can step down in different various stages to the small scale. And we've done, we're able to do that because we understand the larger landscape. Um, and because we understand that larger landscape, obviously we can then, an understanding where we might find in environmental material, we can now start prospecting in a much more um, directed manner for DNA, for paleoenvironmental and obviously for archaeological material. Uh, and again, that's very significant when you're working in the marine zone. The costs and the difficulties and dangers of working in that area make that kind of approach very, very important. It also, as I say, allows for significant new research, both into the plate Paleolithic, but also into the Mesolithic. And as we move forward, we'll be able to understand the new material and the new sites that we discover um, in the future in a much more holistic fashion. So thank you to all these people. Without all these industrial partners, without all these academic partners, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, and I'd like to thank many, many, many of people who, without whose help, this just wouldn't have been able to be achieved. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Simon, and thank you for um, being ahead of time, in fact. Um, uh, really interesting paper. And uh, I can see I'm going to have to redraw my maps of the Doggerland uh, shelf. And we have some questions in the chat box. You can probably see them, but I shall read yeah. them out. Um, our first, I think we can deal with all of them. Our first question is from John Adams, who's saying, are there any indications of settlements of possible forts on water channels? So obviously that is the next stage of research as we've drilled down. Um, there, at the moment, we are just at the stage where we're starting to look for those things. And obviously, as I've shown you, the Southern River uh, um, find, we are at that stage where we can start looking for that kind of thing. There are indicates, some indications that perhaps there may be areas which are more interesting in the, in the landscape and more useful in the environment, but we are yet, we, ha, we ha still need more research and we still need more funding to actually get down and actually explore that air, those kind of areas much more. So it's, it's a, yes, there are indications, um, but we need, as you say, we have the technology, we have the um, ability now to do that and we've proved it's possible. It's now time to step up and actually do more of this to actually do that. So yes. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Trevor Faulkner asks, what age is meant by late Paleolithic? Is it early Holocene? <laughs> so late Paleolithic in this case is late is um, late Pleistocene. So we are talking everything, well, in late Paleolithic terms up to the 10,500 kiloannum BP, so before that in time. So we're talking back, you know, 21,000 kiloannums and maybe a little bit further back in time. Um, so it's the Holocene generally, and this is very, I know Jeff will probably, um, <laughs> probably, probably disagree with me slightly with this, but generally the Holocene is, is the Mesolithic. If you think of the start of the, start the Holocene, start the Mesolithic, in si very, very simple, oversimplistic terms, that, that you can think of it that way. So that kind of boundary kind of um, reflects the late Paleolithic Mesolithic boundary. Okay, yes, these are rather arbitrary uh, mm. labels and arbitrary boundaries. In Definitely. Some cases. Um, okay, um, Jerry Gillies asks about uh, the Fourth Bank complex, a large island group in your recent maps. 
And is that something you're looking into? That's something we will look into. <laughs> um, obviously, Lost Frontiers, as you probably saw with the original diagram that Vince showed up, um, the core area is that northern Dogger Bank boundary um, down to the bottom of the channel. Um, obviously, that full, fourth bank complex falls just outside that. Um, so obviously that is something we, will, we hope to look to in future research, um, but unfortunately with the scope and the limited funds that we have available, um, fortunately that's something we couldn't look into as part of this project, but it is something we hope to look to in the future, for sure. Okay, um, always a good answer look to the future. Definitely. Um, now we have Stina, I hope I've pronounced that right, Hildebrandt uh, is asking, could you it's quite a technical question, I think. Yes. <laughs> what kind of seismic data you use? Right. Okay. Well, that this is this is um, quite complicated because obviously there are lots of different sources of seismic data. Um, for example, the 3D seismic data was taken with air gun, um, bin spacing of 12 and a half meters. Um, but obviously, for example, the parametric echo sounder is a lot higher frequency, and we're talking of resolutions of decimeters. So obviously. There are, as I, as I talked about in the, in the talk, you know, being a nested, moving down in scales of size, there is a broad landscape um, scale that set of data, obviously working on air gun and things like that, moving down to higher resolution data sets, which, such as the pairs, which are working much higher frequency and working much, much more area, um, but working obviously in a much smaller bin spacing and much tighter resolution. So hopefully that kind of answers it, but it, basically the answer is a lot of seismic data and a lot of different types. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm sure that could be pursued in more detail. Mm. Um, now, uh, there's another uh, question here from Katrina Yul Anderson. Uh, time frame for discovery of submerged settlements and direct human rendments. I think the question here is about, I'm not quite sure whether this means when do you expect to discover such things uh, or what age of material do you expect right. to discover? Probably the when? former, I think. Yeah, <laughs> when is a question, I, I suspect is obviously a question of funding and the, it, I can't unfortunately predict the government's mind on whether it feels generous or not. Um, but we have the technology and techniques to do it now. Um, and so for, certainly for the off, far offshore areas, um, it's a possibility. That said, there obviously are places near shore, which for example, Boulder Cliff at Gary Momba, um, who have actually discovered near shore sites very, very close to the shoreline um, in the Solent. Um, so these kinds of sites do exist. And that the fact they exist very close to the shoreline tells us that actually they're probably going to exist much further out. And we, now we have the techniques to find them. So I would hope it wouldn't be too long before we find these things. Um, and on the time scale, well, as I've talked about, um, certainly for the Mesolithic period, and I would say definitely from the Paleolithic period as well. Obviously in the deep Paleolithic, we could go much further back, but for, certainly I think there's possibility for finding things very close, relatively close to the surface in some areas for the late Paleolithic. So that's 21,000 to the um, the, the 11,000 kilo annum time zone. I think there's possibilities there as well, for sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I think we'll just take one more question. I think you've partly answered the, um... Uh, the final question, but uh, um, Mark Bateman asked this rather interesting question about the data gap between sites that we have on dry land, present day dry land and more distant offshore data that you have. What about the near shore zone? You mentioned mm. that briefly in relation to Boulder. Yeah, so that there, is, there is obviously things like Boulder and there is actually new technologies. For example, the parametric echo sounder we used um, and Tina Mission over in Belgium now uses that similar device into very, very shallow water. So we now actually have technologies where we can start joining up um, those two zones. Um, we are still, I'd say, in early days, but um, the technology and the techniques do exist now to start connecting that up. And it's it's really a question of, I think, getting down and doing the work and actually joining those up in the key areas, which I think is the way forward. Um, 